Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, we have somebody I deeply admire on the show. His name is Donnie Mabe. Donnie is a veteran in the world of human performance, and he currently serves as the head athletic performance coach at the University of Texas. Donnie is someone I greatly admire because he's a great leader, a man of character, and he's just an open book. Donnie recently actually published a book called The Secret Sauce of Leadership, and I highly recommend you grab a copy. I put a link in the show notes. It's a quick but very impactful read that distills complex leadership topics into actionable information. It's something you'll definitely want to keep next to your bed and refer to often. Donnie will share his insights today into how to unlock your leadership potential by learning how to be a great follower first. Yeah, let that one sink in for a second. We're going to talk about staying authentic and proactively seeking feedback and mentorship. We also discuss common career stallers and stoppers that you're going to want to avoid. Donnie's wisdom will inspire you to work on yourself, navigate challenges, and make a lasting impact on others. So let's get right to it. Let's lean in and learn from the best. Donnie, the beginning of your book really kind of stopped me dead in my tracks. Why are the best followers the best leaders? Pretty simple to me. It's like, if you're going to be a leader, at some point, you've got to learn what it's like to be led. And kind of what that principle does, you kind of learn to develop compassion and you learn to develop empathy for people because I don't care who you are, at some point, you're going to be underneath a leader that just is not effective or maybe they're disorganized or just not good. And <laughs> and I really believe sometimes uh, if you've ever had a bad boss, I believe that you learn some of your best lessons from people that maybe are not great at leading. And once you learn to follow even a bad boss, you learn from them, you learn how to navigate their personality, their weaknesses, you learn how to fill gaps so that when you become a leader, now you have that insight and the experience. It makes you a much better uh, leader, I feel like, just from that right there. So that's what I mean by that. Yeah, I mean, when you're following a bad boss, oftentimes you just get frustrated and you get lost in your emotions. So what's your secret to being able to work with a bad leader? That's a really good question, honestly. And I think, you know, we've all been there if you've done it where you, dude, I can't take it no more. I can't work here no more. So I believe at some point you've got to change your mindset a little bit or even your lens Mm -hmm. of how you evaluate that. And this is what I mean by that. I think you can sit back and kind of like, cry in your Cheerios or complain and be negative. And we've all done that. I've been guilty of that. That does not change anything. And I really believe that actually makes you worse. So at some point, I know in my career, I've been doing this now 30 years. I've had to change my mindset when I'm in that situation. Like, hey, if I was the boss, what kind of follower, would I, what kind of assistant or what kind of person under me would I want? And so I try to mimic and try to do role shifting in those situations even though I see the glaring weaknesses and things aren't getting done, and I try to press into that and go, hey, I'm going to be the assistant, the follower, the employee that I would want to hire one day. And that has really helped me kind of get through those seasons. Yeah, I guess that goes to your mentality principle, because you made a comment. I just wrote this. I literally had to stop and just think about this one. You said, I can work with anyone. And my wrote down on my book, can you really? Because at some point, I mean, how long have you been at the University of Texas? Yeah, I just started the 26th year here. So I've been here for a good little while. So, I mean, you've demonstrated that you can really work with anybody. And, you know, University of Texas is one of the premier institutions in America. People could look at that and be like, oh, well, he's got this great cushy job. But let's be honest, at some point in your career, it was, you know, crying in your Cheerios, right? Right, it was. I mean, you're going to go through... In a big places like this, you're going to go through disappointments. You're going to get overlooked. You're going to miss a promotion. They're not going to give you a raise. Somebody will get bumped over you. Politics, right? Whatever. And you're going to go through a hard season. And it really just be resilient and find a way to kind of navigate that is a big piece of it. So, yeah, it's not easy. Now, when you're trying to kind of mold into this type of follower, I guess you could say, or teammate, that's a great teammate, you don't want to lose your identity. And one of your principles is authenticity. And you say you were born an original, don't die a copy. 
which I just absolutely love. But like, if you're trying to be a great follower, if you're trying to be a great teammate, how do you do that while still being yourself? Because a lot of these organizations kind of strip away your identity. Yeah. So to be really clear on that one, a lot of these lessons I talk about in the book, you got to kind of make mistakes to learn. Uh, at least I had to I had to go the hard way. And so to that specific, you were born in original. There was a season for me, Eric, where I tried to copy different coaches around me and kind of be just like them. They were militant, hardcore, yelling, not cursing so much for me, but just trying to be somebody who I was not and trying to please whether it's my boss or another superior. And I tried to do that for a season and I was miserable. And finally, what ends up happening is you get miserable, you get worn out, you get frustrated. Nobody's really listening to you. You start to realize as you get a little, some season under you and some maturity, like this isn't who I am. And so you have to come to a little bit of a wake up call, like a smelling salt of like, if I'm going to do this for any much longer, I've got to do it my way and just be me. And so again, just to be really candid, I really struggled with that early on in my career, especially here at Texas, working in football, trying to be this tough guy. And so I had to find the right balance of being hard and tough in a way that I knew was true to me, that I could stand behind and have some conviction to it and not try to be a copy of somebody else that maybe they were a little harder and a little stern or yelling or whatnot. So it was a great lesson. It was a hard season, but great lesson for me to learn early on. Yeah, my career in sports, I I experienced that where there was a kind of a 10-year era in my career where it was like, if you're not fitting into this, there was a certain program that was dominating at the time. And all the coaches wanted a strength coach that acted like this certain way. Exactly. And I didn't fit that mold. And I don't know if I always handled it the right way. I probably didn't. And that was a lack of maturity. But I felt like I couldn't be who I wanted to be. And so in some ways, I left the profession so I could be myself. And now things are a little bit different. But I think it happens. You know, one thing I've learned from leaving strength conditioning and moving into technology is everybody thinks that their profession is the profession. <laughs> and it's right. that's not how it works. There's other professions out there in the world going through the same problems that we're going through. But it's a common issue. And that's why I think your book's going to really have a broad impact because these principles can be applied to really any organization. Yeah, so true. If you're looking for a speaker for your next event, I'd love to come out and share with your team how they can turn stress into strength. Leaning on my experience in developing world-class athletes and my doctoral work in stress resilience, I'll teach your team an actionable framework for how they can build the capacity for more stress with less cost so they can consistently operate at an elite level. In the past year, I've shared this message with wealth managers, investors in commercial real estate, CPAs, and more. If you're interested in learning more, click the link in the show notes or visit www.ericcorum.com. You have a section in your book on career stallers and career stoppers. What are those? I think simply to find what I've seen, Coach, over the years, and you've seen this too, you've done this long enough. Somebody has the aspiration to drive, the ambition to get promoted. But I always like to say it like this. Coaches love to coach people and give feedback, but you know what? Coaches need feedback and coaches need to be coached. And I think oftentimes what you don't always see in our profession, coaches are not getting the feedback and the mentoring and the high level of criticism sometimes that they need. And so you'll see coaches that, man, I don't know why, why do I keep getting overlooked for this promotion or this raise? And they've got some glaring career stallers. Mm. Maybe they have a huge ego. And every time they get in a meeting, they're just dominating and not letting anybody speak. They think it's okay because they've gotten away with it for years and nobody's ever said anything to them. But guess what? Everybody outside that room, they're talking about it, right? It could be, I've seen this, maybe you just lack professionalism. You know, you come into a meeting unshaved or you're using profanity left and right, right? Or you get really emotional one way or the other. I mean, I've seen all kinds of shapes and colors, but... There's some glaring glitch in you, your leadership, your personality. I've seen people just hides in the office all the time. They don't get out and spend time with people and their staff. Those kind of things will keep you from moving forward in your career if you don't give feedback on them and then have a plan or action in place to try to, to strengthen and develop that a little bit. So 
That's what I'm saying. That's really good, Donnie. But I, I'll ask you this. I'll kind of push back on something. I was in a lot of assistant roles where nobody ever offered me feedback. Exactly. My boss never did that. And I know one situation in particular where, first of all, I own all my own mistakes, right? So I'm a grown person. You know, I make decisions. But like I had a glaring issue that if somebody would have brought to my attention, I would have definitely have tried to course correct. But nobody ever brought it to my attention. It took two years and some outside right. person to say something. So what do you say to people that are in leadership roles out there on how they should give constructive feedback? To speak into what you're saying, it's not uncommon for a manager or a leader over a unit not to give feedback, not to have evaluations, not to do mentoring. I remember sitting with one years ago with one of our big unit directors, and I was like, hey, so when do you sit down and have coffee with your boss? Like, no, we don't ever sit down. I was like, what? You don't ever meet? No. I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) I guess it's going to be hard to get better, you know? Yeah. And so I think if you're out there, in the, whether it's business world, coaching, whatever, and you're not getting the feedback, the mentoring you need, there are other ways you can get that, right? One of my favorite quotes I talk about, I don't know if it's in the book or not, but it's simple. It's like work on yourself harder than you do your job. And so I really believe what I found out, I love coaching and whatnot, but you're spot on. You're not going to get a lot of feedback in development sometimes. And so what I found out, if you can get into like, the nonprofit world, there's so many councils and different leaders there, business, corporate stuff, where you can get mentoring. They've got curriculum out there that you can get. Uh, I know I went through a course here uh, at Texas. It's an athletics department curriculum. Not a ton of people go through it, but I got a 360 degree feedback. I've had probably two or three of those in my career here. And so there's different ways you can get feedback, even though your boss doesn't do it, but you've got to be pretty proactive and pretty intentional in doing that. Because I always say this, nobody's going to come to you with a developmental plan and go, hey, Eric, man, here's a plan to move you up the next three to five years. So you kind of take the bull by the, you can't wait for your ship to come in. You got to swim out to it a little bit. And so there's some creative ways you can do that, but don't wait on it because if you're right, most people don't do it. If you have any questions for Donnie, do me a favor, take a picture of the cover art Post it in a story on Instagram and leave a question for him. I know he wants to get back to you and answer those questions. Also, make sure to grab a copy of his book, The Secret Sauce of Leadership. Until next time, stay curious, stay critical, and keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible.